We have a big issue coming in the United States of America with law enforcement. It's about to get uncomfortable. I'll tell you why in a second. We have borrowed money now, and we're about to collapse the dollar. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, we passed more small business funding. And finally, one of the greatest throws and catches I've ever seen in my life. All that's coming up right now on I'm Right. This is about to get very, very, very uncomfortable. I'm talking about having a heart-to-heart -heart with your mother-in-law uncomfortable. All right, so let's just get this out of the way. My, why not? Let's just do it. We have a law enforcement issue that is coming in the United States of America. And the reason I say that's uncomfortable is who doesn't love cops? Well, okay, I get it. Some people hate cops. I'm not one of those people. I'm the guy who thanks them. I have two little sons. I make my sons go up to police officers when they see them and thank them. I don't like to brag. I would certainly never be one to talk about the things I do for others, but I buy them food sometimes. I mean, I'm not going to tell anybody about it, but I do that. I love cops. They wade through the muck. Not only do they wade through the muck every single day, people hate them for it. People always have their cell phones out. Oh, look, he's hitting somebody. Uh, and that's probably racism. If you're a cop, you wake up every day, you risk your life every day. You wade through the bottom 10% of society every day only to have your worst moment put on Instagram and blasted, ruining your career. That's the life of a cop in modern day America, and I respect it. So allow me, having said all that, allow me to say this. We are going to emerge from this coronavirus disaster, this pandemic, these lockdowns, everything else. We are going to emerge a nation with a severe distrust in law enforcement if we don't start stopping, if we don't start stopping. That's not the right way to say that, but if we don't stop this madness now. What madness am I talking about? Well, look, image is everything, right? I mean, it does pay to have a good publicist. I obviously don't need one because I'm so great, but other people need good publicists. You do. Is there anything worse for the reputation of law enforcement across the United States of America than the headlines and videos we've seen recently of cops enforcing these absurd, tyrannical lock lockdown orders. And it's not fair to the cops. Honestly, I'm not even mad at the cops for the most part. Yeah, I think they should back off on some of this stuff, but cops have a boss, just like most people have a boss. Mayor turns to the cops and says, hey, uh, you're gonna go arrest whatever, whatever little old lady you find walking down the sidewalk. The cop can hate that all he wants, but that cop is still a human being. Uh, he needs to eat. He's got to pay his mortgage. He's got to feed his wife. Got to feed his kids. So while you'd like him to say, screw you, I'm not doing it, I'm out. It's also not realistic. So yes, I blame the politicians ultimately, but the American people will not be so forgiving. They won't. And part of what keeps a nation together, any nation together, is the trust that happens between people, normal citizens, and people who enforce the law. Most of the time, obviously, that's police officers and sheriffs. There needs to be some kind of bond there. There needs to be some kind of trust. If that trust breaks down, society itself breaks down. So when I see a father arrested for playing softball with his daughter in a park, the man was placed in handcuffs in front of his daughter. Look at that. That is not in China. That's in the United States of America. You see that little adorable girl next to him in pink? That's his own daughter. His own daughter? Uh, put in handcuffs in front of her for playing with her in the park. And people look at that. And you and I can have a frank conversation about it. I got my own show. I know since you watch me that you're probably more educated and intelligent than all those other people. But a lot of people are going to look at that. They're going to they're gonna pull up social media and see that on Facebook and say, what is with those cops? You know what? Screw cops. And that's not right. But that's what we're doing. Oh, I have more. We have a man paddle boarding in the ocean by himself. Paddle boarding by himself in the ocean. This took place in California. Tell me who that man is endangering. Tell me what harm he's doing to himself or anyone else. 
getting fresh air, exercise, sunshine, and not touching anything but his own property. They not only hauled him off in handcuffs after this, they sent the freaking police boats after him. Do you know how bad that makes law enforcement look? You know how terrible it made the guy look like a stinking bank robber for paddleboarding by himself in the ocean. That hurts law enforcement. It hurts them bad. It puts them, dare I say it, in danger. When you start ruining the public trust in law enforcement, when you start changing the reputation of law enforcement, when people start sneering when law enforcement's mentioned, that puts them in danger. I like having a healthy respect for the local police department. I think it's good for society. I like what they do. I don't like the fact someone brings it up now and I go, okay. A neighbor just the other night in my neighborhood, some little, some little Karen, some little neighbor snitched on him because he was having a get together in his driveway. The cops showed up. The guy told the cops to pound sand. They eventually left. And when this story was relayed back to me, you know what I said? Well, a month ago, Jesse would have been, oh, well, that's, there's no need to talk to a cop like that. Be respectful. He should have just, you know, obeyed what they said. Today, Jesse said, good, screw them. And I don't like that. That's not good. That's not good for me. It's not good for you. It's not good for the United States of America. And these orders that we're forcing these cops to enforce, these orders are what's doing it. You tell a cop to go bust drug dealers, the public's going to be with you. You tell a cop to place a woman in handcuffs who took her kids to the playground. That's not going to look good. I'm recording too. Okay, can you call? Yeah. Her kids are here. Her kids are here. What is going to happen? Who's got her kids? This makes no sense. Where are your kids? This is so wrong. So we can congregate in the grass, but the kids can't play on the playground? As a person, does this make sense to you? As a person. Not as a police officer, as a person, does this make sense to you? Okay, I have to be honest, in retrospect, I probably would have played that video without the audio because that, I mean, that was hard to listen to. But in all honesty, how'd that make the cops look? I mean, you got this little suburban white woman in handcuffs hauling her off to jail. How's that make the cops look? Not good. This is bad for the United States of America. It's bad for law enforcement. It's bad for the public. You are tearing apart the fabric of the public with these absurd lockdown rules, these absurd unconstitutional lockdown rules. We have a man in Long Island. I'm not making this up, by the way. We have a man in Long Island who was placed under arrest for walking his dog without a mask. And you're like, Jesse, he must have been around people. No, no, no. He was just out walking his dog without a mask. We got a problem, people. I know a lot of that may have made you uncomfortable, but I'm right. We got a great show for you. Hang on. I know you're going to find this shocking. All right? It's going to stun you, but um, Congress screwed things up. The government screwed things up. And before we go into a breakdown here of all the crap that was in the last bill, all the crap that's going to be in the next bill they're about to pass, the, you know, small business help and the, the $1,200 you get and all this other stuff, let me just do a brief example in a way that I think you can understand because, let's be honest, it's the only way I can understand it. If I ever want to understand something, especially complex things, I just think about food. So let's say the entire American economy is McDonald's. All right? Entire American economy. We walked in as the government and they said, close the doors. McDonald's is closed. Oh, okay. I, I guess we'll close. And we closed them. We closed down McDonald's. And now McDonald's is saying, uh, 
we are running out of money. Uh, we, we need some money. Could you bail us out? And the government says, well, all right, no problem. You know what? Let's pass a bill. And they pass a bill. And what do you know? Soon, the guy who does the fries, he's got a brand new fryer. They even gave him a brand, brand new batch of fries. Oh, and look, the burger guy, he got brand new burger buns. And they said, all right, McDee's, you should be good. And the burger guy was like, whoa, wait a minute. I, got, I have buns. You didn't give me any burger patties. And the filet of fish guy says, oh, pff, I need some fish. McChicken screaming. The guy by the milkshake machine. The manager. The janitorial staff. They didn't get anything. And the government's, well, I mean, okay, uh, let's pass another bill for just those guys. And then you forgot about the maintenance crew. Then you forgot about the guy who makes the little $1 apple pies that burn the roof of your mouth every time. What I'm trying to say with that really terrible analogy is this. We have a $20 trillion economy. $20 trillion. Do you know how many moving parts are in the $20 trillion economy? No, you don't, because I don't. Therefore, nobody does. It's a lot. It's more than the human mind could ever comprehend. It's more than the smartest man in the world could ever comprehend. You cannot grind that to a halt. You can't stop a $20 trillion economy ever for any reason, and then have the government sprinkle in a little money here and sprinkle in a little money there, and it be okay. And it even do a marginal bit of good. Oh I mean, yeah, the fry guy's happy, briefly. The burger guy's kinda happy, but everyone else is screwed. That's what we saw. That's what we saw with the first $2 trillion bill they passed, which let's, let's, let's pause on that for just a moment. Understand this, as that old great Stalin line was, I mean, I guess it was kind of evil, but also very true. One death is a statistic, or one, mil one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Two trillion dollars is a number that's so large the human mind can't comprehend it. And they just phew, breezed, it like th breezed it right through like it was nothing. And in a breath, they said, well, wasn't enough, we're out of money, we need more. And they're about to pass another $500 billion. What, what are we doing? One, we don't have this money. We understand this, right? You do understand that we were in serious, serious financial trouble before any of this virus or economic shutdown? No, not right away. But Medicare and Social Security cannot be reformed because no politician wants to bring that up. And they are on pace to bankrupt this nation. They are. That was before we ran up a four, five trillion dollar deficit in one year. We don't have this money. And the government can't possibly, cannot possibly, it's not human. If government was run by the smartest people in the world, and it's run by a bunch of idiots, but if it was run by the smartest people in the world, we, we, you can't possibly stimulate a $20 trillion economy. I don't care how many checks you write, you can't. You can't get the money out there fast enough. You can't get it in all the exact locations. The only thing that stimulates a $20 trillion economy is turning the freaking thing back on again. I don't know why we're even shocked. I mean, people are shocked that $9 billion got to Harvard. Why are you shocked? Who's shocked about that? That's government. Government sucks. You know how many, gov how many Harvard dudes are probably sitting there in government? And all it takes is one to be like, you know... It's two trillion. There's no reason my alma mater can't get nine bill. Strokes them a little check, and now everybody freaks out. Trump's out there talking about it. I think a forty billion dollar endowment or some incredible amount of money that Harvard gets this money. Harvard should pay that money back. I want Harvard to pay the money back. Okay. And if they won't do that, then we won't do something else. They have to pay it back. I don't like it. I don't like it. This is meant for workers. This isn't meant for one of the richest institutions, not only far beyond schools, in the world. They got to pay it back. I want them to pay it back. Harvard is sitting on a $40 billion endowment. And I understand that Donald Trump doesn't write the bills. It's Congress's job to write the bills, get them passed. He's got to sign it or not sign it. I'm not actually even pretending that the United States president would have the political capital to veto any bill in the middle of this crisis. He had to sign it. I get that. At the same time, Mr. President, you signed it. That's what you get. That's what you get when you pass a bill. And you know what? This next $500 billion small business bill that they're talking about is going to be clean. We'll get to that in a second. It's not clean. 
Nothing comes out of Washington, Washington D.C. that's clean. You might as well lick the floors of a public restroom. That's what comes out of Washington, D.C. Harvard, I love Harvard's rebuttal. This is, this is hilarious to me. Quote, Harvard is actually allocating 100% of the funds to financial assistance for students to meet their urgent needs in the face of this pandemic. Um, I, I don't want to sound cold-hearted, but I don't give a crap, so I will sound cold-hearted. You're not borrowing money from my great-grandkids to pay some Harvard nerd to go to college. I understand that you've got financial needs. I've got financial needs too. My kids have financial needs. Their kids are going to have financial needs. Their kids' kids are going to have financial needs too. Do we really have to bail out the elite of society at a time like this? No. I'm sorry. I know it sounds a little, a little, you know, pitting the classes against each other. You know, I don't generally do that, but no, I, I, I don't care that you're giving it, giving it to the Harvard students in serious financial crisis. People are committing suicide because of depression after losing their jobs. I don't care about Harvard students. I don't at all. Not even that much. I guess, well, you know, maybe Harvard did need the money. They need to pay their Chinese spy professors. Oh, Nancy Pelosi has thoughts. Here we are today two weeks from that Tuesday of the request, when the Republicans and the administration replied that there was no way they were going to join us, uh, that they had the 250, that's the way it was going to be, there was going to be nothing else. They took a defeat on the floor because the congressional Democrats stuck together, Ben Cardin and Chris Van Hollen uh, objecting and then proposing our proposal which is almost exactly what they passed today. So in terms of holding up the works, they were the ones who held up the works for a package uh, that is more effective, fairer, and the rest uh, as we go forward. And I don't, you know, they, they like to say, oh, we held up. No, we didn't hold up. They held up. And now we have prevailed. This is a real victory. Uh, for uh, uh, smaller businesses, as a uh, leader has said, who really didn't have the banking relationships, but they don't need them under this legislation as it is passed. Yeah, sure, Nancy. And on to what she just said there about the smaller businesses who didn't have a relationship. In case you don't understand what that reference, here's what happened. They passed all these hundreds of billions of dollars in loans for, for businesses. Only if you're a bank, I'm not even mad at the banks about this. If you're a bank and I've got, you know, Johnny's Tires over here and they do a million bucks a year worth of business with me and I've got Annie's Flower Shop and she does $50,000 worth of business with me, who am I moving to the front of the line when he needs a loan? I'm not mad at the banks. The bank's job is to make money. You know how that works. Life's about relationships. So all these big businesses, they snatched everything right up. The little guy, once again, surprise, surprise, got screwed. A $2 trillion screwing. That's what he got. Mitch McConnell. It's unfortunate that it took our Democratic colleagues 12 days to agree to a deal that contains essentially nothing that Republicans ever opposed. In my view, it's indefensible that Main Street small businesses and their workers had their assistance cut off for partisan leverage. That was the word of choice for one leading House Democrat, leverage. The American people cannot be political leverage. So I'm glad we're now po poised uh, to move ahead. Now let's just get this done. Let's move ahead and get it done for the American people. Okay. Don't expect me to cheer. I understand everyone else is cheering. Woo, we're helping them. It's going to be the same thing. Same as it ever was. A big garbage bill that isn't close to enough. Either you open up America again, or you watch it burn. You can pass 100 of these bills. All it's doing is making the problems worse. All right, we got a lot more show. Hang on. Well, our next two guests 
are involved in something that I personally love, and I want you to find out about it. First of all, we are joined by John Birch, Supreme Court and Constitutional Litigator from Birch Law, and Amy Upton, she's the Executive Director for Michigan Nursery and Landscape Association. Now, that was a whole lot of titles. Essentially, Amy hired John, and we're going to find out why. Amy, why in the world did you hire John Birch just for his company? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's so good. Um, so we are, as you said, the Michigan Nursery and Landscape Association. We represent our nursery, the greenhouse growers, retail garden centers, and uh, landscape contractors, as well as lawn care uh, service providers. Um, as you know, COVID-19 has hit the, uh, at our state, uh, has hit it very hard. Um, and um, our governor has taken a strong stance on keeping people safe, and we fully support that. Uh, uh, but we are an outdoor industry, and uh, there are things uh, by virtue of what we do, we are able to do things uh, that uh, go farther even uh, than the zero contact, the no contact, and the CDC guidelines. So we uh, feel that it would be safe for us to, to continue to work. Uh, and we have gone through the proper channels. We went through, uh, we've gone through everything. Uh, we've done everything as we should have, uh, and we have been told no. Uh, so at that point, we contacted John. Amy, before I get to John real quick, can you clarify exactly what it is that you, and obviously the people in your association do? Now I, I know, but can you clarify what kind of jobs, what kind of businesses are we talking about here? Sure, sure, okay, so we're talking about lawn care businesses. Uh, these are the people that are on the front line uh, to take care of our, our lawns. And, and what I'd like to explain to people, because most people don't exactly understand everything that's involved in what we do. The, uh, we are the you know, front line for ticks, fleas, so pests and diseases, not to mention weeds, uh, invasive, invasive species. Um, our lawn care uh, guys are out there quietly taking care of all of these things and preventing uh, the spread of anything uh, that goes to directly to human health. Uh, so, so we're working for you. So those are our lawn care. Our landscape uh, contractors, uh, they are <clears throat> implementing, excuse me, and taking care of properties. Uh, our retail garden centers are supplying the plants and supplying this, the, uh, uh, all of the inputs that are needed for, for people to start their own gardens, to people for people to uh, do different things. And you talk about the pollinator issue. Our retail garden centers are supplying the plants uh, that, that attract and uh, uh, you know increase the growth of our pollinators. John, I've been screaming about this, but I needed somebody with your level of intelligence and education to explain it to me and others. This stuff doesn't seem legal. It doesn't seem legal for a governor to just point at whatever business, obviously Amy's that we're talking about right now, but just pointing at a business and saying, you're, you shut, you're not essential, you can stay open, you are essential. Is it legal? It is not legal. That's exactly why we went and filed a federal lawsuit here in Michigan to stop the governor from enforcing her stay in place order. Now keep in mind that Michigan has the strictest, harshest stay in place order in the nation uh, that does not make any exceptions to the very kinds of businesses that Amy was just describing. Michigan, in fact, is the only state in the country that does not allow landscaping and lawn care and retail garden center activities to take place. And all we wanna do is inject some common sense into this process. In the governor's order, it specifically allows public employees to be engaged in these very things. They're doing it on public. If you're a homeowner, you can do these same things in your own backyard. What you're prohibited from doing is hiring someone else to do this in your backyard, even if you're elderly or firm and you can't do it yourself. And what's so outrageous is that local governments are now starting to issue citations to those homeowners because their grass is too long and it's now a public nuisance because they can't hire someone to take care of it. Uh, it's absolutely Amy, uh, last question for you. Tell me where where this goes from here. Do you Are you suing as well? Do you just want to be free to work? Are you suing the state of Michigan? Are you, Michigan? are you suing the governor's office? What do you actually want resolved out of this whole thing? Uh, we would like to go back to work, uh, and we are prepared to do that safely. So I have been focused. Um, John is doing what John does best for us. 
uh, trying to get us, find us a pathway to get back to work. Um, I am focused on educating our members, supplying them with safety proco protocols, detailed safety protocols that they can start implementing now so that when we get the okay, we are ready to go and we are going to do it safely. Um, I just want to say the majority of our businesses are family owned and multi-generational businesses. The very last thing that they would ever want to happen is for somebody else to get sick. Um, so, so we are fully prepared to implement what we need to do. And, and it won't be difficult because again, uh, a lot of what, our, what we do um, already, we are doing individually. It doesn't make any sense uh, to, to do it in groups. Uh, so we're already there. Um, we're just making sure, uh, getting the crews to the jobs, uh, making sure that we can do that safely, cleaning the equipment, uh, doing the different things that, that we'll need to implement. Because I don't think this is going to, uh, this is, isn't going to go away this season. I think we're going to be living with this for a while. And we are prepared to go back to work safely. I agree. We are rooting for both of you on this show. Go get them. Go make it happen. Amy, John, y'all keep fighting the good fight. Have a good one. Thank you. You as well. We are not done yet here on I'm Right. You get a lot more me and a lot more entertainment. Hang on one second, all right? Well, if we can find one silver lining in this whole pandemic economic disaster we're dealing with right now, it's that we have kids being educated at home. Sorry, you can yell all you want. I'm a fan of it. Granted, I'm not the one stuck educating our kids, but let's be honest, people. Our public school system in the United States of America is a disaster. It is an absolute disaster. You know how I know this? Because I listen to a lot of podcasts. I talk to as many parents and young people in my neighborhood as I, as I possibly can. Just trying to gauge, you know, real life. Not New York City bubble, D.C. bubble stuff. I try to gauge real life, about what real people go through. And the truth of the matter is this. <clears throat> young people, they don't like America. And the reason they don't like America is they learn in school that it sucks. That's true. Our education system teaches young people how crappy the United States of America is. On top of that, let's just be honest. Public school, it's an all-access club where everybody's allowed in. Now, that may sound nice to you. you. You can say things like, yeah, everyone should be allowed in. But is that a club you want to go to? Of course not. You want to go to exclusive clubs. You know why you don't want to go to the all-access club? Because you're going to meet nine people you love, and they are nine people who are cool, and all of a sudden, there's one person who has to shoot up the place. Because the bottom part of society drags down everybody else. That's just a fact. And the truth of the matter is this. You have these horrible parents who treat their kids like crap, and they drop them off in school, and they expect the school to do the parenting of the poor child, and your kid, who's there to get an education, doesn't get near the attention he needs. And if he does get the attention he needs, he's learning about what? What do they learn about America in school? You talk to a kid these days? I do a lot. You know what they learn? They learn three main things about America. This is where they spend all their time. They learn that we slaughter the Indians. They learn about slavery. They learn about civil rights. And right about then, they wrap things up. Right about the time the commies start executing over 100 million people worldwide, I think we've covered enough history. We don't need to go into that. Gee, I wonder why that is. So I like it that America's kids are home now and getting an education at home. And oh, talk to some of these teachers who have to deal with kids who've been homeschooled and kids who've been to public school. Find out what they have to say about it. Find out what they have to say about the education levels of kids out there. So it's a great thing, right? These kids are home, they're getting more attention. Well, no, it's a great thing for you. It's a great thing for me, for the left, who has had their dream realized of kids being taken away from their parents and educated by the government for years? Well, they don't like it because in a leftist mind, the kids belong to the government. We have 
never invested as much in public education as we should have because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investment. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> we have to break, break away from this idea that kids belong to their parents, they belong to everybody? These people are insane. No, no, my parents do not, my kids do not belong to that nutball. I promise you that. In fact, if I have my way, my kids will never be in the presence of somebody like that. But that's what they want, and they want it for a reason. This is no different than any other version of leftism that has ever existed. You must take away all the influence except for leftism. It can be the only thing that exists. If you give people options, if you give them education outside of that, they will inevitably choose something else. So you must eliminate everything and only be leftists. That's why they're that way. Now. Just had to go off on a brief tangent on that today. I need to defend Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick of Texas. He said this. Let's face reality of where we are. In Texas, we have 29 million people. We've lost 495, and every life is valuable. But 500 people out of 29 million, and we're locked down, and we're crushing the, the average worker, we're crushing small business, we're crushing the markets, we're crushing this country. And what I said when I was with you that night, there are more important things than living. And that's saving this country for my children and my grandchildren and saving this country for all of us. And I don't wanna die, nobody wants to die, but man, we gotta, we gotta take some risk and get back in the game and get this country back up and running. He is getting blasted. He's getting at both barrels for saying the truth he's saying something that every leader worth their salt and the history of the world would say people it is not an outrageous thing to stand up as the leader of a nation as the leader of a state and say i understand we are going to lose some people we are going to do everything we can to save those people short of completely destroying the nation in which we live part of leadership is you do make life decisions. You do trade lives. You do decide this person has to go for this person's sake. That's the most uncomfortable thing in the world. It's horrible. You're probably horrified right now, but that's what you do. As a leader, as a president, as a governor, you have to decide where's the greatest good lie. If we retract the United, if we contract the United States economy 10, 20%, the devastation on that will be way worse than anything that coronavirus could have ever done to us. That's just the bottom line. You want to know what keeps people alive? We're going to talk about lives. A good economy keeps people alive. A robust healthcare system keeps people alive. Have you looked around you? Do you know what's happening to our healthcare system right now? It's collapsing, and it's not collapsing because of coronavirus. It's collapsing because we locked down America. And hospitals are closing, doctor's offices are closing, pediatricians are closing, dentists are closing. When we emerge from this, we will find our lockdown strategy did way, way, way more damage to the public health than coronavirus did. It's a fact. All right, we got more. Hang on. Well, immigration is once again on the forefront of everybody's mind right now. We have an executive order, I guess, coming from President Trump. What does all this mean? To tell us that and other things, Jessica Vaughn joins us now. She's the Director of Policy Studies for the Center for Immigration Studies. Jessica, that's a mouthful. What do you all do? <laughs> uh, we are the nation's only research institute that uh, studies the impact of immigration on Americans and American society. What is this executive order that's coming, or maybe it already came, I can't seem to figure out exactly when this thing's coming or what's happening with it. What is it from the president? Why do it now? Do you support it? you not support it? Well, it's hard to say whether I would support it or not because nobody has seen it. Um, and so we're as um, curious about the contents of it as, as you are and, and all your listeners too. Um, 
reportedly it is going to pause legal immigration to the United States for 60 days or possibly longer. Um, and it's it's not clear what that means, whether this is people who have already been issued green cards or whether they're simply pausing um, the processing of people applying for green cards. Either way, if these immigrants who are paused are simply going to come two months later, it really doesn't have much of an impact on Americans at all. Uh, what potentially could be the more, more significant order is one that has been promised on the entry of temporary workers. And these are people coming for jobs that are supposed to start over the summer or in the fall and, and who have not even started in those jobs yet. And those uh, potentially could be made available for American workers if these temporary visa programs are canceled. But we don't know that he's gonna do that. So it's we're still really waiting to see what could happen. Um, there's a lot the president could do on this issue, but uh, it hasn't done it quite yet. These temporary workers who maybe come over the summer, can you elaborate on that? What, what are they coming here for? Well, um, there are a couple of different programs that add up to hundreds of thousands of jobs for visa workers. Uh, the seasonal workers uh, work in resorts, restaurants, um, on you know, on uh, in landscaping jobs as uh, lifeguards at pools around the country, uh, hotels, and so on. Uh, the ones who start in the fall are the white collar guest workers who work in IT services, accounting, nursing, and uh, uh, physical therapists, more permanent type jobs. Uh, all, but you know, we we admit something like a million temporary workers each year, and some of them have already come, but a lot of them have not. And so that's why that would be especially helpful to American workers if the president would if not completely suspend, at least cancel a lot of these visa programs for the time being. Do we do that too much? I mean, separate from coronavirus, separate from this economic downturn and everything else that goes with it, do we do this too much? Uh, well, we certainly do admit um, too many temporary workers because uh, there's a lot of evidence that they displace Americans and cause the pay rates to go down for everyone working in that particular occupation. Uh, I don't think we, the president has done, well, he's done a lot to improve these programs, but there's a lot more he could do. And, you know, even with respect to the green cards, there are things that he could do. Uh, for example, all of the green cards in the employment-based categories are on the basis of a labor certification that was done months or sometimes even years ago, it would be a good idea for the labor department to open those back up again and see if that employer is even still in business and still has a need for foreign workers. And if not, uh, tell the immigrants, sorry, you're gonna have to wait until our labor market stabilizes. Now that would be a real help to American workers. Simply delaying the entry of people who are gonna come anyway is not gonna do the trick. But you know, again, to be fair, we have to see what is in the executive order. And uh, we should also see if the president does something on temporary workers. What can he do? Separate from Congress, I mean, let's just be real, we're not going to have anything decent immigration-wise pass through Congress as long as Democrats control the House. And frankly, if you ask me, we, even if Republicans are there, we wouldn't get anything decent. What can the president do with a, with a pen legally? Well, he, he could possibly rescind the permission for these employers to hire foreign workers because they ha under the law, they have to show that um, that they're not going to displace Americans or adversely affect wages and working conditions or opportunities for U.S. workers. So he could really enforce that very strictly now, given the current um, situation we have with double-digit unemployment. It's, it's hard to really argue um, that you can't find Americans to do these jobs. There's another program that the president could end with the, you know, the stroke of a pen by writing a new regulation. And that's called the OPT program, which offers about a quarter of a million jobs to um, people who've come in on student visas. 
that he could and he could end that program right away and now would be a good time when there are so many american grads who uh, you know have are going to have a really tough time finding a job uh, you know their their academic year has come to kind of a um, you know, uh, a disappointing end, and they're going to be looking for work, and it's going to be hard to find. So that would be really something that the president could do that would help a lot of people. Do we have a problem with student visas? Well, not all. A lot of them are perfectly legitimate and are great to have. You know, our system of higher education is a real, uh, it, it is, is not only an economic benefit, but something we're just proud of, but there are too many schools that are fly-by-night that are allowed to bring in foreign students. There is um, there is not a, enough uh, enforcement. Uh, when these visas expire, a lot of them stay on and become illegal aliens. And this whole idea of automatically offering a job opportunity to anyone who graduates from a U.S. school is, I think, very controversial because uh, there are a, this is direct competition with American and legal immigrants who are graduating from these schools, and it's it's displacing them from opportunities that they need, especially right now. Jessica Vaughn, let's hope somebody starts listening to you. Do you feel confident Donald Trump is going to start listening to you? I, and I say this for this reason. I think he has the right idea when it comes to immigration. I think he is surrounded by people, <clears throat> Jared Kushner, who do not have the right idea when it comes to immigration. Do you have I, confidence in him or his team? Um, I have confidence in his instincts. The problem is, is he um, there's a tug of war within the White House over this issue, and the cheap labor interests usually um, have an, the upper hand over the higher American. Um, spokespeople within the administration. Uh, so I, you know, I hope he goes with his gut because that's what's usually right. Jessica, thank you for your time tonight. It's good talking to you. I've seen some amazing athletic achievements in my time. Um, yeah, this one probably tops them all. Hang on. Well, I miss sports. You miss sports. That's who we are as Americans. So when I saw this video, I have no idea who this guy is, by the way. I have no idea who to credit for this amazing thing. And I have no idea how many takes it took him to pull this off. But I just want you to sit back for just a brief moment. It's only about 10 seconds long and enjoy one of the greatest athletic feats I've ever seen. I have no idea how he did that. Again, I have no idea how long it took him to do that, but that's freaking awesome. Good for you, brother. America. All right. Let me do it again tomorrow. I'll talk to you then.